Hello and welcome to season five of The Writer's Mindset with me, Ellie Betts. Christina is still hiding away, hard at work on our new patron exclusive series, Healthy Habits. We're here to create a community of authors who persevere, are their most productive selves and publish at a speed that they are comfortable with. This week, I sat down with Shane Miller to discuss how to craft a brilliant beginning. Shane Miller is a fictionary certified story coach and the author of the Write Better Fiction Craft Guides. He's also the author of the Myth and Magic Urban Fantasy Thriller series. Shane holds a BA in journalism and is a member of the Alliance of Independent Authors. He lives in Buckinghamshire in England. He has taken too many writing courses to count and enjoys reading as much as possible. Shane is obsessed with five things. The writing craft, mythology, personal development, food and martial arts movies. I do want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons for your support. We couldn't do this without you. And amusingly, our latest supporter on Patreon is Shane himself. Thank you for your support, Shane. It means so much to us. As a patron, you get early access to episodes, bonus content, and our undying gratitude for supporting all the hard work that goes into creating these episodes to inspire and motivate you. And, as I mentioned, Christina has been working on a patron-exclusive series called Healthy Habits. We have had a lot of great feedback on that so far. Definitely make sure you go and check that out. Healthy Habits is available on our Patreon. To find out more, visit patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. With me today on The Writer's Mindset is Shane Miller. Welcome to The Writer's Mindset podcast. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. For our lovely listeners then, can you first tell us who you are and what it is you do, please? I certainly can. So like Ellie said, I am Shane. I'm a fictionary certified story coach editor. I write craft guides for writers and I also write urban fantasy under the pen name S.W. Miller. Um, I got into writing because years and years ago maybe 10 years ago now I wrote a really shit book and I mean bad really bad and I found that book a couple of years ago three years ago now and read it and I thought oh it's so bad I've never read anything that bad and I just thought I have to do better than this so I got to learning about the craft of writing wrote my first few novels and now I've turned my hand to writing guides. So that's pretty much me. That's you. And we are talking about Brilliant Beginnings today because uh, I believe you have a book about Brilliant Beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> I do. So first and foremost then, why is it important to have a brilliant beginning? And what happens if we don't? Yeah, so for me, it's really important to have a brilliant beginning beginning because the first thing that the reader experiences when they open your novel is the beginning and obviously if they don't ever get past the beginning um, they're never going to get to read the rest of your book so it's the most vital thing for me because it's important to hook the reader in Um, I mean if you don't hook the reader in then chances are they're not going to read your book I mean that's 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 the long and short of it and I think it's also important because it sets the tone for any future books you release as well. So if a reader reads your first book, the beginning is great. They make it through the book. Hopefully the rest of it's great. They'll likely go on to buy and read other books from you. Absolutely. I I know I've definitely put ones down before where the beginning didn't hook me. So, (laughs) and that's a common thing, isn't it? People talk about it all the time, books that they didn't finish. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've all got those you know, a pile of books on our shelf that we probably wanted to read and were really looking forward to because the cover looked great and the blurb was fantastic and it hits your genre and all of those things. But then the beginning was just a letdown or something didn't quite click for you. Yeah, now it just looks pretty on my bookshelf and it's, you know, more expensive than wallpaper, (laughs) but it looks nice. (laughs) Exactly that. Out of interest then, in your book, do you class the beginning as like just the first few sentences, the first page, or it, more than that? So for me, in terms of the book, I would class the first 10% as the beginning purely because that is the part that your reader can read for free if they were to download a sample from Amazon, for example. 
So yeah, the first 10%, anything over that, I'd say we're edging more into kind of later on in the story. And again, that's why I think it's so important because 10% sounds a lot, but it's not really a long, uh, a long amount of time to hook your reader, to be honest. No, you have to make a quick, first, good first yeah. impression of 10%, <laughs> don't you? You don't have much time. <laughs> you mentioned, obviously, the sample on Amazon there. How has the way we actually consume books now affected the importance of nailing that beginning and making it brilliant? Yeah, hugely. I mean, I'm sure growing up, you remember if somebody bought you a book or you bought a physical book, you kind of were wedded to it already because it's it was a time investment, a money investment. You know, so you you sort of thought, well, I'll keep going, even though it's not as good as I would possibly like it to be. And chances are you would have reached the end. But I think now with so many people downloading samples and people do do this, they'll download a sample. I know someone that doesn't even read past the first three pages. And if you don't get them in that first three pages, they're not reading the book. And I think that's what's changed the immediacy of how readers can sample as many books as they want to. Um you know, they're not going to look like that weirdo walking around the bookshop, not buying any books anymore if they're trying to read the first few pages physically. So that is what's changed. I think that's why it's so important because it's so readily available now. And if you if you fail to hook them, they're just going to move on to the next thing and they'll forget about you. There are so, as you know, there are so many authors, so many new books being published each year. You have to strike a really good first impression. Absolutely. I do know one person, and they are absolutely the exception to the rule. They give each book a hundred pages before they give up on it. Oh wow. And I that's, just think that's hardcore. <laughs> that is hardcore because I I don't know anyone else that would do that. That is dedication. I know a lot uh, can change in a hundred pages, but that is um very unusual. Most people, like you say, if they're not gripped straight away, they are not carrying on. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And like you say, if you're at home, you can sit and download as many samples as you like, right? I know I do yeah. it. I uh, Yeah, definitely. Me too. I'll see books I want, especially on Twitter and stuff, and I'll go, oh, should I buy it? And my <laughs> finger hovers over the button. I'm like, no, just get a sample. Yeah, so. definitely. It's, uh, it's TikTok for me. If I see a, a book top video, I'm like, oh, get the sample. And then, uh, yeah, it, it, there's just no, there's no risk, is there? And I think that's what's right. changed before. If you went to a bookshop, you were investing money in a book and it would be, you know, seven, eight, nine, ninety nine. Now you, you can get a free sample. You feel more obliged to read it yeah. when you've paid money for it, right? Exactly, exactly. Now there's no barrier to entry, so people can just sample. And if you're not, you know, it's quite cutthroat. If you're not hitting that right first impression, they're going to forget about you and your books. Absolutely. I have done it many, many times. Yes. <laughs> There's a section in your book then that details your nine blocks that make a brilliant beginning. Could you go through those for our lovely listeners, please? Yes, I can indeed. So like Ellie said, I think there are nine important things that everybody should do if they want to create a brilliant beginning. And I break these down into blocks. So block one is the invisible question, which is essentially the very first line of your novel you use a statement in that first line to pose a question in the reader's mind. And a really simple example I can think of for this one is something like the phone rang. Obviously, you'd make it a bit more um, high stakes than that. But readers are going to instantly want to know who's on the phone. So they'll ask themselves that question. They have to keep reading to find out the answer. So that's the first thing that I would say is important. The second block is the what I call the five foundations of a relatable protagonist. So essentially, there's a lot of writing advice that says your protagonist should be nice. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this. Uh, nice protagonists for me are a little bit boring. So if we think of something like The Hunger Games, for example, hugely successful series, Katniss is in no way likable. She has redeeming qualities. And I think that's the difference. You, you create a character with a wound, so something that injured them in the past. In Katniss's case, that would be... Um, the death of her father in a mine explosion, for instance. You would give them a scar after her father died. Katniss's mother failed to look after them. They were neglected. She's got a lot of psychological baggage around that. You'd give them something they want. In Katniss's case, it's to win the Hunger Games, something they need, which in Katniss's case is to learn that she can let other people in and trust other people. And that's the thing that's going to allow her to win, ultimately. And then you'd give them something unique, so a talent that is unique to them. And in Katniss's case, as we all know, that is her proficiency with a bow and arrow. 
Uh, building block three is a character driven everyday world. So essentially you filter everything your reader sees through that protagonist scar. That scar will be impacting everything about their life from how they think about their family, their friends, their home. So that's what you're doing there. The fourth is a transformative lesson. By the end of the novel, hopefully your protagonist will have healed their scar or at least be on the way to doing so. Building block five is all about striking the right tone. And when I say tone, I'm talking about, so, I mean, you wouldn't open a thriller with a love scene and you wouldn't open a romance with a murder scene, hopefully. So. You want to like be you wanted it to be successful, no. <laughs> well, no, that's it. Yeah, if you're if you're hoping for commercial success, murder scenes in a romance, probably not the best way to go. Um, that sounds like so, a challenge. Yeah. I might try it. <laughs> I mean, give it a go. Let me know if it works, but we'll see. No, I, I'm gonna st- I'm gonna stick with your advice on this, Shane. I think you're right on this one. I'm just wondering you are. Hopefully. And then building block six is all about using the senses to enrich setting. So their uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. What we're trying to do is create a 3D experience for the reader because they can't see anything, so they have to feel it, essentially. The seventh building block is all about creating realistic antagonists. So similar to your protagonist, you don't want to make your antagonist inherently evil. Um, I think that's a trope that's probably been done to death now. What I would say is that you should make your antagonist realistic. So give them a loving side, give them redeeming qualities, give them someone who loves them back. And most of all, I think whatever their motive is for the thing that they're doing, make it relatable. So make it something that other people can empathise with. And that's they're the, they're, they're the villains that stick with me the most. I don't know about you, Ellie, but I think when I can identify with an antagonist or at least have sympathy for the reason behind what they're doing. It makes the story all the more powerful. Absolutely. We've had um, Sasha Black come on to talk about um, writing antagonists and and evil villains and stuff, and that's exactly what people want. And one of my favourite source uh, character arcs is Anakin in Star Wars because you so relate to yeah. why he does what he does. I, I want to say no spoilers, but I'd like to think about what watch stars <laughs> right now and know what I'm I think talking about. seen it, right? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> it's only been around, like, what, 40-odd years. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, he does the wrong thing for the right reason. You can so relate to him and still want him to win, even though he's doing something terrible, right? Yeah, yeah, Maybe completely, because he's, you know, he's doing it for the woman he loves at the end of the day, so that's... Again, that is classic. Give them somebody they love and someone who loves them in return and make well, exactly. that the reason they're doing the thing they do. There are a lot of um, protagonists out there who do what they do for the person they love, right? Yeah. So having yeah. that from that other angle, I think, is really powerful. And like you say, relatable. When you can relate to that antagonist, oh, my God, so powerful. Exactly. And the other thing to remember, of course, is that the antagonist always thinks they're the good person anyway. So they would do the quote unquote good thing for the right reason. Um, So, yeah, I think with villains, that's what I relate to. The eighth building block is all about conflict and tension. And when I say tension, I mean the threat of something bad happening. Um, And when I say conflict, I mean the bad thing actually happening. So I think one of the big reasons why some scenes in novels flag or why newer writers can't quite get a grip on where a scene is going it's because there's not enough conflict there. So there has to be an obstacle in every scene that's in the way of what the protagonist wants, essentially. Because if there's no obstacle, it, it becomes easy and nobody wants to read that. That's kind of boring for me. And then the last block is the grenade, um, also referred to as the inciting incident, but that's never felt big enough for me. I chose the term grenade because it is the thing Whatever event you choose, it's the thing that destroys your protagonist's life or their everyday world, the way it's the way things have been going, and it knocks them off the status quo. So in a thriller, for example, this could be the murder of the lead detective's entire family. In a romance, it could be a chronic singleton who meets their love interest. That would change the trajectory of their everyday world. So they're the things you're looking out for to end. And I think the best thing about this is that if you time it right and you get that grenade into the 10% mark, which is where your sample ends, your reader's then going to think, oh, this big thing's just happened. Now I need to find out what's, what's going on. So they'll buy the book, hopefully, and read on. 
I love the idea of referring to it as a grenade. That's so much more impact, isn't it? I yeah. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting then. What is your opinion on having a prologue at the very beginning, opening a story with a prologue? Oh, I've got really mixed feelings about this. <laughs> I mean, I will say, <laughs> I will say everyone it does... seems to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a really tricky one I mean first I would say it depends on genre um so if you're talking epic fantasy then the rules of the world are huge so sometimes you do need a prologue from a different character's perspective to explain the rules of the world without being info dumpy so just dripping it in a little bit but even with epic fantasy I'd say I'd probably err on the side of not using a prologue I think it's probably best to always start the novel, even if you've got point of view switches throughout the novel, probably best to start with your protagonist point of view in the current moment that they're in um, without adding a prologue. Because I've, I know, I've read some bad prologues, you know, where it's just... There are right, so many explain, of them. Yeah, 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 definitely, where you're like, I'm going to explain every single thing you need to know about the magic system, about the... I don't know, the structure of the police department, whatever. <laughs> and then you get to whichever the first chapter is with your protagonist in and you just don't care as much. You know, you want your reader to bond with your protagonist pretty much instantly. So if you can avoid it, even with those genres that do typically have a prologue, I'd probably suggest you do that. That was very diplomatic. Most people would just say, don't use prologues, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Never, ever. No prologue. Uh, I'm not or, saying never. Or on I've read some good ones. Side. People are either like that, I find, uh, super anti-prologue, or like, no, I love a prologue. So <laughs> that was very no, think... thematic, Shane. I'm quite impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I do think they have their place sometimes. There are there are a couple of, of good ways to use a prologue. So if you're doing something like a flash forward in a thriller and you're showing the the moment at the end of the novel where everything is going to wrap up and then you go back to two weeks earlier, for example, that can work. But I think it's prologues that are set in the distant past that I have an issue with because, one, the events aren't really related to anything that's going to be happening in your story. And two, like I say, it's mostly it's just an excuse to info dump. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot out there. And again, if you are just info dumping, right, you're not going to hook the reader. You no, haven't nailed it. that big, brilliant beginning. You don't have any, potentially any of those nine blocks if you're just no. going to dump a lot of information. So people are probably not going to read on. Exactly, yeah. So nine blocks seems like a lot, although I'm sure you're right. <laughs> I'm sure um, <laughs> having all of them makes a great a great beginning. I certainly have some ideas for my novel now. Um, Good. Which, out of all of them, which one block people should absolutely nail, even if they can't do them all? So I think I'm going to rebel a bit and say that there's two. That I think are essential. <laughs> I'll allow it. I'll allow Good. it. Good. <laughs> Great. So, and that's the first two. So I think you need to pique the reader's curiosity on that very first line of your novel. So you need to get them posing a question to themselves so that they will instantly want to read on an answer. Because at the end of the day, if your reader never gets past the first line of your novel, then they're, it's pointless. They're never going to read any of the story. So it won't matter. And the second one, because as we've just been saying in the great prologue debate, um, connecting with your protagonist is vital. So I'd say spend some time before you start writing, before you even think of a plot, potentially, just giving your character those five things, the wound that injures them, the scar that affects them psychologically. Think about what they desire in terms of an external plot device. Think about what they need to become a changed person by the end of the novel and kind of heal their scar and then just give them something unique that makes them stand out from all the other characters. And I think that if you have those five things in place, your reader's going to connect to your protagonist, definitely. That's good. I really like that scar concept. That's got me thinking of all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> regarding the question then, so obviously creating that question right at the beginning, mm. you use the example of the phone rang, which I know is not a great one. Um, nope. Do you have any <laughs> other examples? Like, can you use dialogue, which I know sometimes people are a bit iffy about? Um, is there? Do you have any other examples that would be useful for us to sort of picture? Yeah, definitely. So there are, there are ways you can use dialogue and that can work really well. Um, <sighs> I would more say, rather than overt dialogue, if you're going to go with something like that, it's probably best to use 
an internal thought of the character that sounds like dialogue <clears throat> so that they the reader can hear the protagonist's voice but it's not on the nose so i think in um a good example of this is like in stephen king's the shining the first line is something along the lines of jack torrent saying um what are you doing you officious little prick or something like that so it it sets the tone for his voice that's a strong read... start for a book <laughs> it, it is very strong it's a bold choice um, but it, it is. is stephen king so he can do what he wants he's allowed <laughs> yeah he can do what he likes but um yeah, so and starting bold is also good. You know, that that hooks the reader into that shock factor. But yeah, so that particular opening line, they'll want to know why Jack's so annoyed. They'll want to know why, like, what is this guy doing that's wound him up? And it just paints a picture of his voice as well. So I think that's a really good one if you're looking to open with a voicey character, which I think most people are. You know, we don't want our character voices to be forgettable. Oh, that's really useful. Which of the nine blocks you mentioned do you see new authors miss, mo- miss most often? <laughs> I swear it's just water in my glass, Shane, I promise you. Okay, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> yeah, which one do you see, What like either in their first books or early on books, which of those blocks you mentioned do you see missed most often that you think could really improve that beginning? Yeah, I would say it's probably connecting the reader to the character because I think there's such a heavy emphasis on plot in the writer community in general that I'm guilty of it myself. We spend so long plotting that we don't think about how the plot connects to the character because at the end of the day, you can, you know, there's only a certain amount of plot archetypes, if you like. You should be able to take your character and put them into any plot and your character will have an influence over the plot what you shouldn't be able to do is take any cookie cutter character. So if you've just found a template for a character online and stick them into a plot, that shouldn't work because the plot and character are fused. So it's all about what's going on externally in terms of what um, obstacles your character facing in the plot. And then it's all about what's going on internally, as in how do those obstacles make the character change? And what we should be doing is designing our character in my opinion and then designing the plot to kind of complement the character's internal journey and I think if we do that then you're going to create a plot that people really want to read as opposed to just trying to shoehorn a plot into your character's life I like that character first and then just have the plot work around their arc yeah I like that that's a good perspective um (laughs) you're quite the professional Shane I like it well I don't know about that but we'll go with it (laughs) we'll go with it (laughs) Uh, what is the biggest mistake then that you see published authors make in their beginnings no naming I don't want to name and shame anyone but you know (laughs) (laughs) out of ones you've read perhaps what what are the mistakes you've seen yeah I think the most common one is a desire to or two things actually a desire to info dump which we've kind of already talked about because I think especially fantasy authors and I'm one myself and I did it when I first started writing myself as well. We're so scared that the uh, the audience or the reader won't understand the world that we've created or the magic system or whatever, that we just bundle it all in the first chapter, which is not ideal because it, it takes away from the story. So my advice for those world building issues, if you like, would be to drip feed the information slowly. So Over the course of a chapter, maybe if your protagonist is magical, they cast one spell and you see what that one spell does. And it gives you a a taste of what the magic system is like. And then as you progressively go through, you add more and more things as opposed to just dumping it all in at the start. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing I see a lot is the story starting too early. And what I mean by that is when we design our characters, we come up with so much backstory. You know, we know... Um, what their childhood was like, what their teachers' names were, all this stuff that's been going around in our heads for ages. And it's stuff that doesn't need to be in the book, unless obviously your character's teachers are relevant to the plot, in which case you might want to mention a few. But yeah, it's, it's that unnecessary information which disrupts the flow of the story and makes it a slow start. I think they're the, the two main things that I've seen. Definitely. I um, I like when the magic system is done really well. Like I don't need to know everything straight away. But no. the author needs to know everything straight away. And you can feel whether or not they do, even if they're just strip feeding you bits of information about it, right? 
Exactly. And that's a good point you made. So I think, correct, the author does need to know because you need to know your own rules. But like I said, the author just wants to share that knowledge. And it's, you know, just hold back, keep an element of mystery. That's how I like to think of it. So all the way through the book, whatever you're revealing, whether that's anything about a character or a magic system or a setting, just do it slowly and, and keep the reader engaged. So even when, say, for example, your, I don't know, your character meets their love interest for the first time, don't necessarily go in all guns blazing. Her hair was like this and she looks like this and she sounds like this all at the same time. Drip feed that stuff in slowly and you're more likely to build a slow connection. Are you saying we should think of our magic systems as a love interest and feed, oh, for sure. feed them in yeah. slowly? I love that yeah, idea. 100%. <laughs> hmm, romancing the magic system. I like yeah, it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. I like that. New book idea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I imagine our listeners are going to be very inspired by the information you're sharing with us today and maybe want to rejig their beginnings a little bit. <laughs> but Nine Blocks, as, as much as you are, the detail in, that you've put in the book is very good, Nine Blocks might feel a bit overwhelming. <laughs> what would be your advice as someone who knows that their beginning needs a complete overhaul but is feeling a bit overwhelmed by the concept of it? Yeah, the first thing I would suggest is that if you really are feeling overwhelmed, take a break maybe a day or two um, just to reset because overwhelm, if you let it fester, as we all know, it can quickly tend to burn out, which is not what any of us need, especially when we're using our brains all day to write words. So yeah, the first piece of advice I would say is definitely take a break, come back to it with a fresh head and then read it through and you still think it's not as good as it could be, or you're not hooking the reader or it's boring. Then I would say, go and pull out, five of your favorite books and read the starts of those books. Try and read with an eye to think, well, what is hooking me in? Why do I love this story so much? See if that's something you can replicate. And I will say not plagiarize, please. Nobody wants any plagiarism. Um, but see if you can replicate kind of the tone of that beginning. What is it that made you want to read on in the first place? And I find that if I, you know, we all do, we all get stuck. It doesn't matter how many novels you've written, how many um, how many books you've got out there and published, you will get stuck at some point. And I think the key thing is just to lean into whatever in those favourite books of yours makes you want to read and see if you can replicate it. And you'll often find that as you're reading these novels, ideas spark in your head anyway. So I'd say start with that, go back to it, and then see if you can gradually layer in even three of the hooks. You know, Don't tackle all nine at once but do it in stages. So maybe tackle the first three, have a break again if you need to, come back, tackle the next three, have a break again if you need to, come back. Because it's a horrible feeling knowing that something's not working, but you don't quite know what it is. But I do think that if you go away and you analyse what you love best about the books you read, it can work with movies too. If there's a particular movie that you love or a TV show, go and watch the first episode or the first 10 minutes and try and work out what it is that's hooking you in. That's really good advice. I think emulating those stories that you enjoy anyway can be really helpful. And people, well, I know I certainly am guilty of forgetting that, you know, there are books out there that I like and I can probably learn something from. Yeah. Them. I, can, I tend to think of reading and writing as quite separate in my head occasionally. And I'm like, no, wait, hang on. <laughs> they are very connected. <laughs> I need to remember that the books I like reading, I can probably um, learn from. Uh, yeah, I think we all get get into that mindset when our head is so into a book or one of our books anyway you just get that tunnel vision of oh this is all I can focus on right now but sometimes you just need to give your brain a break you know just go for a walk do anything just have, have a break come back read something good and or watch something good either way and try and work out what it is that makes it good essentially and see if you can do something similar but not the same yeah, no plagiarizing. Definitely no yeah, plagiarizing. We We're not condoning <laughs> plagiarizing, <laughs> but you can like you can emulate it, can't you? You can yeah, sort it. of copy the style and yeah. make it your own. Definitely excellent. Well, I do have the most important question I'm going to ask you now coming up, which is, <sighs> which book changed your life? So again, I've got two because I couldn't possibly <sighs> narrow it down to just one. I'll still allow it, Shane. Seen as it's great. Soon. Thanks. <laughs> 
So the first book that changed my life was Jack Canfield's The Success Principles. Um, I love that book. It changed the way I think about motivation. It changed the way I think about success. It changed the way I motivate myself. And it just made me more productive because it's all about finding essentially your purpose and finding the things that will make you successful. So I would recommend that to anyone listening if you're struggling with mindset issues around imposter syndrome or fear of failure or fear of success, those types of things. Uh, that's a great book. And then another book that changed my life was the book that inspired me to write fiction in the first place, which was Jim Butcher's Stormfront. It's an urban fantasy novel. It's I love amazing. I've just finished The Dresden Have series you? a few weeks ago. I absolutely oh, love it. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I so that series. <laughs> It's great. That series, yeah, that one really inspired me to write. I got to the end and I thought, ah, oh, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. Exactly. And I think he does the magic system really well, actually, Jim Butcher, because yes. it's not all at once. It is sort of drip feeding. But I don't know about you. When I got to the last couple of books, it felt like everything so far had been building up to that, yeah, um, including it, it the was... magic and the world and everything like that. It was great. Definitely. Fantastic example of how to layer in um new supernatural species or new elements of a magic system over a series and a brilliant example of how to tie all the plot threads together at the end which mm. is something a lot of us struggle with i know i will be in my current urban fantasy series so we'll see <laughs> there how are goes. a couple of points in the dresden file series where there were bits of the magic system that you sort the the reader knew and something would happen and the reader you as a reader you can go oh my god he's gonna have to do this or he's gonna have to do that um, and that does sort of happen, but then he surprises you with something else. And it's, yeah. I think it's really good. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's a great thing too. think of if you are trying to work out how to surprise your reader, the first idea that you have is not going to be the one. So you just need to keep thinking of those little twists and tweaks you can add to the book and, and try for something unexpected. Don't just go with the first thing you think of. No. Although I listened on audiobook the first time I went through. And so Jim, um, the Dresden actually just looks like Spike from Buffalo. Oh, it's Spike, James yeah. Masters. It's just, it's just James Masters. <laughs> and I saw, actually, because I've already read the books on audiobook, but I saw there was a trailer for the last two, which I only discovered the oh. other day. They did a trailer before the last two came out because they came out both in a few months apart. And all the characters looked nothing like I imagined them. No, they never <laughs> do. <laughs> they never do. I was like, why don't you just get James Masters to do this? He'd be into it. It's fine. <laughs> oh dear actually the first book you mentioned there was it um jack canfield yes yeah the success principles i, I think i spotted that in the background of one of your instagram videos <laughs> you may well have done so, yeah, it's on bookshelf, so i it's thought possible. you might be a fan of that one yes <laughs> in which case then where can our lovely listeners go to find out more about you of course if you want to reach out for a chat yeah, you can get me on Instagram or TikTok. I'm at SW Miller Author. And you can find out about me and my books at my website, which is swmiller.com. Perfect. I'll make sure to include all of those links in our show notes. And thank you so much for joining us today, Shane. Oh, thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. If you enjoyed The Writer's Mindset, we'd be super grateful if you could leave us a rating or review on the podcast platform of your choice or a thumbs up if you're joining us on YouTube. It really helps other writers to find us so that we can help them achieve their wildest writing dreams too. Make sure you check out Shane's new book, How to Write Brilliant Beginnings, Crafting Your Novel's Opening Chapters Made Easy. He really does make it easy and he manages to articulate the reasons behind different elements exceptionally well. I have gotten a lot out of it myself. And don't forget, if you'd like early access to episodes, the chance to submit questions for our guests, and to listen to our new bonus series, Healthy Habits, come join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash writer's mindset. We've got a lot of big things planned, but we can't do them without your support. Every little bit helps us to help you more, whether it's a rating, a review, or becoming a patron. We'll see you next time. Keep writing. <laughs>